Father, we thank you for this family that we can just sit here, Father, and we can study your word. As always, Father, I just pray that we hear your heart, that you help us, Father, in our walk with you. Please guide us where you need us to go. Open up our eyes to what we need to see. And we thank you, Father, that you continue to lead us and go out before us and come in behind us. In your shoes, let me pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. The work that you were supposed to be prepared for last week. Take two. Okay, Genesis 15. Last thing we kind of discussed before the sideline last week was dealing with Melchizedek. And um, how that sort of tied in with Yeshua and so on. And Abraham coming back. Having that moment with Melchizedek. Rescuing Lot. Um, from the four kings of the north. Time passes. 15 verse 1. Sometime later the word of Adonai came to Avram in a vision. Don't be afraid. Avram, I am your protector. Your reward will be very great. Now again, when dealing with the covenantal promises of Abraham, you see certain ones that overlap. When you go through 12... 15 mainly, we're going to see some promises in 17, um, and this becomes something that he sets up. So he reminds him again of certain promises that he got. Mm. Avram replied, Adonai God, what good will your gifts be to me? Now let's pause there for a second. What pertains to Avram is the fact that he's going to go, you're going to give me stuff and it's going to go to someone else. Mm. I would like you just to think for a second about maybe your walk with God at this moment. What good will your gifts be to me? What good would this covenant be to me? If. Now sometimes there's like this question mark in our hearts that we kind of go I'm stuck in this place and I'm struggling to move forward because I don't see the picture I don't see your promises coming into into fruition I don't I don't see what you're doing you keep on telling me this thing but I don't see anything happen and this sort of creates this hamper for us mm -hmm. is this question mark Abraham's question mark is just saying you're giving me all these promises but I still don't have a child What's the point? Is it just for me? You said that I would be the father of many nations. I remember the list of promises that he got. Kings would come from me, from, from me. Look at the dust of the earth, you said. How does, what does that mean? Sometimes where we are, we kind of get stuck. Because we're listening to the word. And we don't know how to navigate past it. We don't know how to see past it. And this is what I want you to see. Even in Abraham's life, these moments, guys, this guy is not a young man. He left when he was 75 years old. We're coming up to the point where he's going to be 99 soon. Mm -hmm. And God is still busy meeting him and he says, one more step with me, please. Just one more step. But where to? I don't understand. Just take the step. Just, yeah. No, I just I'm thinking from things I've heard from people like they've been praying for years, and I'm thinking like Abraham is almost it's been almost twenty years. Yeah. That he's been waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. Yeah. So just like. Yeah, we we read the Bible and we go through the chapters and we're like, and God did this with Abraham, and God did this with Abraham, and God did this with Abraham, and then you wait a week and you don't get an answer. The reason for that is because we we read in the Word. But we still think like the world. Mm. Part of. And also we're an instant coffee generation. Yeah, we like instant coffee. Yeah. <laughs> he's only a hundred years old. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, okay. yeah. he's only, <laughs> yeah, no, only because look what he lived to. Yeah. He's, not, he's halfway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he is, is it? How long did he live for? 183? 175, I think. 175. <laughs> 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 Two thirds, maybe less. Yeah, he's still going to get other wives and kids way. after this. Yeah, he's going to go 
So that's my act. Well, I'm not going to sit here like, like fulfill it now. I know I'm not ready. And I'm not even God. <laughs> and I know I'm not ready. And that, you know, he's turning over things. Yeah. This, yeah, this, this, this. He's busy on me. It's not that plan. I'm not here for that plan. That's a good, that's I'm a good point. I'm here to be with him. But if I'm with him, I'm content. I'm not... It's, get me to my finish line. It's a, it's, it's a good point you're making, Matthias, because someone, there's like, there's, when we do Joshua, eventually, you'll see a simple principle. You'll bring him across the Jordan, right? And you think, now we're in. We're in enemy territory, and now we're going to go to war. These boys better watch out. We're going to conquer the land, and we're going to smash them senseless. And God's like, no. Sit. Yeah. <laughs> He gets them to celebrate Passover. They do this yeah. rededication with the heel of foreskin. Mm. And then sit. Mm. And then there's people that are getting me. Jericho's locked up shop. They are panicking. What are we going to do? Go for a walk. <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite of... <laughs> what blows my mind is once they conquered Jericho, and they should have, because Jericho was basically the main, I want you to see it as maybe like a toll gate or that frontier, protected mm. that line. Mm. But after Jericho, it was open Pretty season. Shiny, yeah. He actually marched them down to put them in front of Jericho. They could have gone around it. Mm. Number one. Number two, once they conquered it, he takes them back to the place, mm. Gilgal, and he says, sit. Mm. Now, why did he keep on doing that? Mm. Because there are times when he's preparing you. Yes, no, he's always preparing you. There's times when he's preparing the people that you're yes, going to meet. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And there's times he's preparing the place. Yeah. Okay. Right? Because you might be ready. And yeah. he goes, I know, sit with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not. No. And you're going, just yeah. let me into the land. Like, no, it's not ready for you. No, we need to deal with that character. <laughs> <laughs> he's like... He's worried about when the, the barley is going to come up of the ground and he goes, now we're going to go. Yeah. Why when the barley? Well, you want to eat, don't you? Yeah. But we have manna. No, the manna is going to stop when you go in. <laughs> huh? Mm. You see, he's busy dealing with people at so many different facets. And we can only deal with where we are now. Mm. But if there is something maybe that's just getting you to question, maybe it's an age thing, maybe it's a an identity thing, maybe it's uh, um, I don't I don't understand the plan mm. of what you're going at. Maybe it's a provision thing. Mm. I don't know. That's why I think you sit and you ponder that thing for a second. What mm. good is God in my life right now mm. when He says I've got a plan and purpose for you, and you go yes, but mm. I'm not seeing. Mm. You're hanging yourself on the door and you're saying, basically, I'm not ready to move until I get clarity. Yeah. Yes. And God's looking at you going, take a step forward and then you'll move out the fog. Mm. I think our problem comes also with the fact is that if we know too much or we know what God's plan is and it's clear in our minds, we're going to actually start digging a road. Or run we're going to make our own road. And that's why God leaves you sometimes. And then all of a sudden you look back and you see, you know, there's a paved road that I've been on and God has got a purpose, showing me or fulfilling His purpose in me. Right. Whereas if I knew it before the time, I would be, my road would be like Abraham, you know, had the idea. Oh, I would have, yes. I mean, he knew, God said He's going to be the father of many nations. So He started making nations before oh, God. Yeah, we're going to get to that part now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 I, I termed the phrase, you make an Ishmael. It's a problem. But yeah. in this narrative, okay, what then is your response? If you know that you're maybe it's sitting there and you can't see clearly, and we're struggling at the place we're at, what can you do right now? That's it. Lord, your will be there. Here I am. Yes, Lord, here I am. Worship. Yeah. It's Him. Build on you and Him. In many cases, it's 
it's relationship, right? Yeah. He's mm-hmm. giving you this opportunity to sit at his feet and kind of process where you are. Mm-hmm. Understand how big this is for Avram. I'm going to just, by the way, the Messiah is going to come through you and there's going to be this whole cool story and it's going to be like four shadows and things and it's going to be amazing. You know, the Passover story is going to come from your children. The Messiah is going to come from your children. The nations are going to come and worship you because of what you did. The temple is going to be built in the same place you offered up your son. What God is setting up is so much bigger. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just thinking that also I went through a stage where I lost everything. And uh, yeah, I went bankrupt and lost everything, I had nothing left, and God's lesson to me through that all was, trust me, hand everything over to me and trust me, and I found that one of the most difficult things to do, because I was a new Christian, you know, quite a few years, new to the world and that, and I'd had a business which had crashed, and uh, I, I lost everything. You know, I, I didn't even have anywhere to live anymore. And, and God said, I will restore everything to you, but you must trust me. You must hand everything over. And I don't know, I don't know that woman, but as men, we find that, you know, we want to fix everything. Yeah. We don't want to give it to God and hand it over and say, all right, Lord, I, I'm actually useless. I can't. I've got to trust you yeah. through this. And you will see it, hmm. not me. You know, yeah. Whereas I, and that was the lesson I learned, and I, I, I've lived that way ever since. And it's, it's a fact. It, it comes through all the time. Right. If we get to the place where we can see that these moments, where God is wanting to do something in His timing, Lord. Getting you ready to receive it is getting you to understand and hang off the promises of the bigger picture. Mm. But a lot of the time, you can only deal with one mitzvah at a time. Mm. So what you are dealing with right now, that thing in your heart, maybe, like I said, maybe it's about age, maybe it's about an instruction, maybe it's about a promise that you're not seeing fulfilled, whatever the case may be, that thing is where you need to sit at others' feet and go, mm. this is the best place for me. Mm-hmm. You can't move forward. Mm. You can't change this. Nothing in Abraham's power is going to change anything. No. But God is going to change everything through Abraham. Mm. And also, God knows, because he says, do not be afraid. Mm-hmm. Now, why would you say, do not be afraid to somebody that's not, what's good? I'm, but I'm not scared. Mm-hmm. Of course he's scared. He's scared that none of this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. I'm a hundred. None of this is, what you said, it's not going to happen. We are running, I'm running out of time. Well, not scary. you running out of time. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Yes. He's got it all planned, but it's his plan. Mm-hmm. Because we can only see like this. Yeah. Down the road. And with hindsight we see better yeah yeah and abraham's already learned but like god is looking like yeah and god says i'm your shield which means hmm. yeah. nothing's going to come from the front and hit you or from there or from there you, you're so protected and surrounded yeah. and your reward and which means i'm waiting at the end hmm. it's already you know i'm your reward one step at a time and look at the thing where he got stuck with the partial obedience thing. Yeah. God told him to leave your father and everything else and he didn't listen, right? Now he's been separated from Lot for a time. But now he really, even though he brought Lot back, Lot doesn't... Where do we find him in the next couple of chapters? Still living in Sodom and Gomorrah, not near. Now he's in the city because he's scared he's going to get ransacked again and taken off probably. He completely separates himself. And this is again the time that God's like, let me let me deal with you. Mm. Not your father, not your uncle, not your nephew, not your dog, not mm. this person, not thing. It's you and me now. And he hits him straight with what his question mark is. He says, what good will your gifts be to me if I continue childless? And Eliezer from Damascus inherits my possessions. 
Right? Eliezer is the guy, chief steward in his house. You haven't given me a child. Avram continued. So someone born in my house will be my heir. But the word of Adonai came to him. This man will not be your heir. No, your heir will be a child from your own body. Then he thought, uh, sorry, then he brought him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If you can count them, your descendants will be that many. So second promise of something that is understandable and tangible really to Avram. It's not the dust on the earth. I can create life. Adam from the Ad Adma. Here he's saying, look up. Why? Why doesn't he say, count the water droplets in the ocean? <laughs> Maybe it's because it's like a tangible thing. You can physically, you can actually count them. You can. You can see them. It's not water is a mess. When okay. you're looking up, you're not looking at yourself. Yes. I think there could be a few illustrations to this. Have you ever sat down, when you looked at the earth, do you feel small? Not really. You look at the dust behind underneath you and you go, oh, look, there's dust. But when you look up to an open sky, how big do you feel? You feel tiny. Because you so much. There's an expanse and that the heavens declare his glory. He calls each star out by name. God created all of this. This is so much bigger than me, number one. Number two. If it is about the kingdom of heaven, and in the vast expanse we see specks of light, again, each star is a representation, right, of a child of Israel. So what is the point? I'm going to bring light out of the darkness. And it's something so much bigger than you are from. Okay, I read up on a, on, on a study they once did with the guys I've mentioned before, I think, where they actually sat in Southern and Northern, in Northern Hemisphere, they actually counted the stars mm -hmm. on a clear sky as much as they possibly could, and they got to about 600,000. Same thing on both sides, they can't count more than that. Okay? That's what they could see, eh? Yes, without telescopes mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. I mean, they're talking about billions and galaxies and all the rest of it. And it's funny to me that when we do accounting, there's always over 600,000 men in the camp of Israel. Okay? It's this interesting little correlation where God's like, if you can count them, look. So he goes in verse 6, he says, He believed in Adonai and he credited it to righteousness. Mm -hmm. All right, now this is a big term. Again, righteousness is... <laughs> What does it mean to be righteous? Holy. No, holiness means holy. Set apart. No, that's holy. Right standing. Right standing with God. Okay, the sh short term will be right standing. The Greek leans to something a little bit different. It means that which God sees, He sees with approval. I'm going to write this down because you always ask it and I never know. Yeah, that's why we have no tools. That which God sees, He sees with approval. So when it says, God, if God gives a, an instruction, is it a righteous instruction? Yes, it is, because it comes with His approval. If He looks at a righteous pr person, what does He say? You're righteous because... What made Abraham righteous in that statement? He just he believed God. Right. His faith made him righteous. He believed me. And that oh, meets God's approval. Okay? Doing acts of tzedakah, acts of righteousness. That's when I give to the poor. Look after the widow and the orphan. Right? It's funny, when you go to Israel, they don't, they don't say, give me money. They don't say kesef. They say, Sedeka, give me righteousness. What they're asking for is help. When they see a person who sticks to God's instructions, they don't say, oh, look, there goes a religious person. They say, there's a Sadiq, a righteous man. Now, think about how that works. He's giving of God's, with God's approval. He's walking in God's approval. 
It's not just right standing. It's me walking out my faith. I believe, therefore I walk. Now it's that that the, the writers need you to understand and it is of utmost importance to understand that righteousness is it's multifaceted. Right? But it comes down to that same core principle. I am saved or I am considered righteous because of my faith. Base point. That's where we get it from. The problem becomes when I understand that God's word is righteous, me doing righteousness doesn't change the fact that I am not. You understand the difference? If I am doing the word out of my own to try and be perfect and blameless, good enough to make it into the kingdom, am I going to get there? No. no, because we have all fallen short. There is not one who is perfect. So therefore, I have to get covered by the righteousness of? If Yeshua's blood covers my sin, if he is my covering, then I'm righteous. I'm seen with approval from God because I put my faith in him that his sin covers me. Oh, uh, sorry, his sin. The fact that he covers my sin. Is that making sense? Yeah. Now listen to the other side of righteousness. Romans 2, um, verse 12. Romans is a study I think we're going to have to get into fairly mm -hmm. for some time. Yeah. It's good fun. <laughs> How is that the renewing of the mind then? Mm. Well, that's two as well. Yeah. Romans 2, Romans 2, verse 12 and 14. Okay. It says, Romans 2, 12 says, All who have sinned outside of the law will die outside of the law. And all who have sinned within the law, within the law will be judged by the law. For it is not merely the hearers of the law whom God considered righteous, but rather it is the doers of what the law says who will be made righteous in God's sight. Can I get you a... There you go. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So what did we see there? It is the hearers of the law that would be considered righteous or the doers of the law that would be considered righteous? Doers of the law. But I thought righteousness was only about faith. Faith without actions is dead. Right. Faith without works is dead. If I believe God is God, I should act like it. If I believe that He is going to, if there's going to be a judgment. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that believers are going to be judged? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there are scriptures that say no, the true believers will be judged. Different type of judgment. Mm. Mm. Okay, we have the judgment at the end of Revelations, correct? Mm. The white throne judgment where everybody who didn't believe is going to step up and have to give an account for their life. Correct. Right? The, the dead that were not in Christ will give up, or the graves will come out, and the people from who died at sea will come up and they will all stand before God, and He's going to go, now what? Open up the books. Let's see what your life is about. Mm. But we've already been raised for a thousand years before that. So, what would a believer's judgment look like? Remember Matthew, Matthew 5 talks about if you teach the least of these... You nullify the least of these instructions, you will be called least in the kingdom. In heaven. And if you teach 
teach to obey these and keep them, you will be called great. So there seems to be, again, maybe the, the parable of the talents is, a, is another illustration that Yeshua used. He says, when he came there, he goes, okay, servant, what did you do? I gave you something. Now that could be your spiritual gifting, that could be your salvation. I'm going to have to give an account for my life. What did I do with the gift you gave me? Did I invest it in the kingdom? And remember the hard condition of the, of the guy at the end with one talent and he took it and he said, I stuck it in the ground because I knew you were a hard man. The hard condition towards the, of the servant towards the, the master was the biggest indicator in what he did with that man. There was no love for him. Okay? We have this, we will have to give an account. Mm -hmm. You've been given Yeshua. You've been given the Holy Spirit. You have the word in front of you. What we do with these, is it going to be for God's glory or is it going to be for mine? That is a very different outlook. And a very different type of standing to give an account. Okay? Now here he says, if we are doers of the Torah, we are, we are righteous. We are not just hearers, but doers. Okay? It says, for whenever Gentiles who have no law do naturally what the Torah requires, what the law requires, then these, even though they don't have the Torah, for themselves are Torah, are the law. Now he's dealing with a Jewish Gentile identity, and he says, you know, we're so busy stuck with it's them and us scenario, and we think, um, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but we, we make it about ourselves. He says, I'm going to deal with each people group according to what they have. Now, they will naturally do. Why would they naturally do what Torah requires? Because they have no law. Because it says in the New Covenant promise that I will give them the Holy Spirit, which will cause them to obey. You know, I mean, you might not know everything. I mean, God knows. It's a learning experience as we read through the Bible. But if you, if you knew that Becoming a drunkard was a problem. When you became a believer, you said, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Something that we considered was maybe fun and okay and innocent enough, all of a sudden turned into, I'm not going to be that guy. What changed? Alcohol didn't change, the circumstance didn't change, but you did. <coughs> because now we want to be pleasing. Mm -hmm. And everything that God gives in an instruction is pleasing. He carries on in the book of Romans, and we probably, for the sake of Genesis, and, and that in chapter 4 in Romans, he goes into a discussion all about how righteousness was given. And the main point he's trying to make is he's saying, everybody's fallen short. We need to be doers of God's instruction. But listen, that is not just doing the instruction without having faith or in Christ is not going to get you into heaven. Simple narrative. Yeah. Okay? You are saved by grace through faith. What you do with your salvation, on the other hand, is should be a life of surrender, a life of obedience, and a life of discipleship. That becomes our narrative of, okay, Lord, here I am, use me. Live like your rabbi. And that is righteous in God's sight. Because Yeshua was the Sadiq. Not a Sadiq. He was the Sadiq. He was the perfect picture of being in right standing or being <coughs> seen with approval from God to the point that it was then becomes our righteousness through Him. Okay, back to Genesis. This is an important concept that we have to make sure we understand. It was a credit to him 
as righteousness because he believed. And because he believed, just like Noah, his obedience led him to do something. Let's see what that looked like. Then he said to him, I am Adonai who brought you out of Ur of the Chastim to give you this land as your possession. He replied, Adonai God, how am I to know that I will possess it? He answered him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, cut the animals in two, and placed the pieces opposite each other. But he didn't cut the birds in half. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses. But Avram drove them away. As, he, as the sun was about to set, a deep sleep fell on Avram. Horror and great darkness came over him, or great dread or fear. Adonai said to Avram, Know this for certain, your descendants will be foreigners in a land that is not theirs. They will be slaves and held in oppression there for 400 years. But I will also judge that nation, the one that makes them slaves. Afterwards, they will leave with many possessions. What was that? The Passover story. Okay. As for you, you will join your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Only in the fourth generation will your descendants come back here because only then will the Amorites be ripe for punishment. How long does God wait for the Amorites to get their act together? God gives nations an opportunity, a people group, to see. He's reaching out to them as they speak and they just refuse to see it. Mm. What makes Avram different from the Amorites? <coughs> <laughs> he took a chance on a God he didn't really know as did you you believe in a crucifixion you never saw you believe in the Messiah who is eternal that you might have never met I say might might have in the physical form and yet you have not only bet your life you've bet your eternity on that reality You are walking in a relationship with the creator of all things. What a gift you have. This opportunity to be called his. After the sun had set, there was thick darkness, a smoking fire pot, and he and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between these animal parts. That day Adonai made a covenant with Avram. I have given you this land to your descendants from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the territory of the Kenani, the Kenezi, the Kadmoni, the Hiti, the Perizzi, the Rephaim, the Imori, the Kenani, the Gagashi, and the Jebusi. Split the animals. Right? Which animals did he split? <coughs> the cow. The big ones. The big the ones. Old. Okay. Mm -hmm. What animals did we have? The heifer. Cow? The ram. Sorry. Wasn't the female goat? <coughs> a female goat and a ram. A female goat and a ram? Do we all concur? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the pigeons. Turtle dove and the pigeons. So we have a female goat. A ram and a pigeon. Pigeon. And a turtle. And a turtle. And a turtle. And a turtle. Are we all in agreement? Yep. Yeah. Are we looking at the verse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say cow, it says it's a heifer. Yeah, heifer. Yeah. 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 It's a young, a young cow. Young. Oh. It's a moon. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we take this one and we make it two. We take this one and we make it two. We make this one and we make it two. We take this one and we put it one. How many turtle doves and how many pigeons? One pigeon. No. Eight turtle doves. Okay. 
Is it one and one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says A. 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 A usually means one. And he wrings their neck and he places them opposite each other. Yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. Something to look at. Yeah. We take the blood. Because these are on two sloping hills, the blood is running inward. But the, 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 yeah. Sorry, the pigeon was not sprung. Mm -mm, it was just run. But the blood from the cow of the goats and all the rest of it is still going to create the... Why is that you start saying? Well, one, one, one and one. One and one. One turtle and dove and one, one pigeon. pigeon. One okay. pigeon and <laughs> one turtle dove. Pigeon. Okay. Okay. I can spell you. They're not... Uh, they're not, the they're not opposites, yeah. yeah. Okay. We, remember, we have one, two, three, four. Hmm? Yeah. And then we have one, two, three. Yeah. Split, yeah. four, five. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're just breaking up the picture. Is something different. You guys have been through the study before. Is a possibility of eight elements. Yeah. Okay. If. And again, it would be a stretch, something maybe to look into. There were two pigeons and two turtle doves. That would leave you still with ten. <coughs> one is talking about something new. new. And the other one is talking about uh, the covenant. Ten is generally a number when it deals with covenant. right? Ten commandments and so on. Okay? So we create the blood carpet and then what? We see two elements that go forward. Yeah. What do we have? A smoking pot and a uh, burning something. Burning thing. A fuckle. Burning pot and a burning yeah. torch. Touch. Yeah. This one with the burning. Let's use the word ash. We've seen it before. Ash is ash. Ash means fire. fire. Remember? Mm -hmm. Where do we see this? China. It's interesting to me that that word ash pops up in some interesting places. The next time it's used is at the burning bush. Also used for the parts of the lamb also used for many of the offerings and funnily enough with the golden calf as well mm -hmm. some for destruction some for worship so he takes his, his elements he comes in we see two elements pass through the blood we understand these are elements of light and it says, God entered into them, enter into a covenant with Abraham. All right. Case closed. How did Abraham enter into that covenant at all? <laughs> right. In this type of covenant, normally the two people walk through and then they go, all right, it's you and me and... This is between you, me, and your descendants. Forever. And if anybody breaks a covenant, remember with a covenant, if a covenant gets broken, there has to be restitution. There has to be a form of payment. There has to be a penalty. There has to be something to fix it. God does not seem to require that from Abraham. He requires it from himself. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting that he says that you believed me and it was considered righteousness and the next picture he gives him and he goes, I'm going to show you what that faith is going to do. When you break this, and he knows he's going to, when your descendants walk away from me, when they make all of these mistakes, someone's going to have to pay the price. And it's Yeshua who does. Right? Passover story. Faith and righteousness, the cross, sets it up. Abraham, I want to do something here. It's bigger than what you understand. Remember his question. What good is what you're going to give me if Eliezer gets everything? Mm. And 
God goes, oh, no, no. You're thinking about you and your house. I'm talking about me and mine. Let's deal with salvation, shall we? Yeah. But while I'm busy, I need to get you right and your physical seed so I can bring him so that I can deal with this and then we can... He's still worried about What's quite busy. interesting also I saw this week is that when God cut covenant with Noah yeah. and he gave him the rainbow as a sign, the first color is red and it also talks of blood and fire. Hmm. That is interesting. And in the in the Jew, that red is representative of blood and fire. Yeah, normally, yeah, yeah. the flesh, yeah. yeah. Nice link. Ends up with? <coughs> is it blue? One of the blues or one of the last ones? <coughs> got, uh, the next color. Violet. Okay. Royal Actually, interesting to find out what the other color is all. The first one is red, and that. It's something to look into. Yeah, interesting. Okay. How long have I been terrorizing you so for? It's just talks about God's consistency, you know, that he used basically blood and fire with the Abrahamic covenant that was involved in Noah's covenant also. It's a nice link, thank you. Yeah. Interesting. You guys want to carry on a little bit or you need a break? <laughs> All right, we'll take a two minute break. I mean, 10 minute break. All right. Okay, chapter 16. Now, Sarai, Avram's wife, had not born him a child, but she had an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar. So Sarai said to Avram, Here now, Adonai has kept me from having children. So go in, sleep with my slave girl. Maybe I'll be able to have children through her. Avram listened to what Sarai said. Okay, now listen to the timeline. It was after Avram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan that Sarai, Avram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian. All right? Yeah. 10 years we're waiting for this promise. Mm -hmm. Now, she's being... Abraham believed God. She's probably struggling. And then decides that this is possibly how God needs to do it. I think we've probably of all um, thought well, along these lines. It's her or what she owes. Right. So now I go, oh, that must be it. That's how God's going to do this. And it's not the miraculous intervention. <laughs> this is the plan. Okay. So he sort of gets given Hagar. Okay. Yeah, I'll deal with that after. It was after Avram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan at Sarai, Avram's wife took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to Avram, her husband, to be his wife. Avram had relations with Hagar, and she conceived. But when she became aware that she was pregnant, she looked on her mistress with contempt. Why? Because she was, she was the one bearing the heir. Why am I still the servant? And <laughs> <laughs> it was allowed, actually. Yeah, it was permitted yeah. in, in a weird cultural issue that yeah. we've got going on here. She was, Sarai was hinting at the point of adoption. If this does happen, it, oh. the baby gets born upon my knees and then I take that child as if it was my own. Mm. So then why does Hagar go, I have now contempt for Sarah? She's going to take my baby. Mm. I'm, I'm fertile. It's a bless, blessing from God. If you've been watching this, thing, watching this thing play out, everybody mm. might have thought, we don't know if the problem lies with Avram yeah. or if it lies with Sarah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, mm. you're the one. Mm. You've been this issue the whole time. Right? Remember, in these days, it was a big thing for someone to bear a child. Okay? And now it's like, you are less than. How many? If Hagar truly loved Avram, she didn't exactly kick up a fight here. You don't hear her viewpoint of whether or not she should have been married to him or not. And she's like, it's your fault. 
You're the one that should have given him children. He's been struggling. Now, how many kids should this man have had? But you haven't given him any. And that becomes shameful for the wife. Mm. Okay, again, this is a cultural problem. All right? So, Sarah said to Avram, <coughs> This outrage being done to me is your fault. I told you it's always your fault. <laughs> you don't listen to <laughs> You're starting to get a, a, an interesting wordplay or, or a, um, inside scoop to what Sarai actually means. With a lot of the translations, they will say it means princess. But it comes from the root, root word that can also mean quarrelsome. I want you to look at this come out. You will take Hagar. That's exactly what she says. And then complains that it's his fault when it actually works. Mm. Oh. Yep. Okay. We're seeing a different side of this. All right. <clears throat> this outrage being done to me is your fault. True, I gave my slave girl to you to sleep with. Was that the case? <laughs> or was it so that she couldn't conceive? That was the point. But when she saw that she was pregnant, she began holding me in contempt. May Adonai decide who is right, I or you. However, Avram answered Sarai, look, she's your slave girl. Deal with her as you think fit. Then Sarai treated her so harshly that she ran away from her. She's been elevated up to a wife of Avram. And it's so bad that she'd rather run. What do you think Sarah is doing? Do you think she's running around with a whip? Or do you think she's just... I think she's just being cruel to her. Mm. How? Probably with a sharp mouth. Mm. This tongue is going and it's... Why? Why? Yeah, and if you listen to your mistress, you can command everybody else to make your life difficult. So now you are really on your own. You mm. might have the sun, but you're on your own because everybody's being nasty to you. Mm. Mm. Dealing with this thing where it's all now this creating this volatile yeah. environment which Sarai created. Yeah. The angel of Adonai found her by a spring in the desert, this spring on the road to Shur, and said, Hagar, Sarai's servant or slave girl, where, where have you come from? <laughs> Like, isn't that the first question after the fall? Mm. Where are you? Mm. Knows exactly what's going on. Mm. Says, where are you going? She answered, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of Adonai said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. That's tough, man. And yeah, you don't want to be there, but I, I need you to be there. Yeah. How many times do we not want to submit to authority? Why do you suppose it is? I'm talking about from a people point of view. From you. God gives us an instruction. We kick up against it. Someone says, listen, I need you to do something. We kick up against it. Because she thinks we know better. Maybe. No, always the dark. No. dark against the light. No, but for you. Because you've never learned submission. Right. So what does submission mean? Keep you right. So it means I'm accountable to number one. What else does it mean? <coughs> you are under her and she's higher than you. And we do not like that underdog feeling. <laughs> we do not like to be We under actually anything. treat them that they're worth nothing and we are better. Yeah. Look at the personality that's coming out, Jay. Mm. You you did this. Mm. Now there's a jostle in position, and then now it's a case of, listen, go back and submit. Because it doesn't help running away from there. Who needs to learn the lesson? Hey, well, Sarah Hagar needs to, and Hagar hey, needs to. to know her position. You always run away from your problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's had 10 years where Sarah took her from, she was probably given by Pharaoh. To Sarah. Which brings us to another Kenya. thing. Can you imagine if God opened up the womb of Sarai closer to the time after Egypt? What would people think? 
Pharaoh's baby. Oh, it's Pharaoh's baba. Mm -hmm. Abraham's child. Mm -hmm. He gives us massive space of time and there's no way this works. Reverses the idea again on the thing of saying the problem doesn't lie with Avram. Mm. But God wanting to do something new. He wants to create. He wants to show the world that this is Him. And to do that, He doesn't just have to work on Avram, He has to work on Sarah. Sarah also. Here's the thing submission is a gift. Mm -hmm. And it's one built with trust. As much as we point it at the ladies and we're saying, Scripture says, submit to your husbands. We do not, as men, always take that same advice. The verse before it says, submit to one another in love. And husbands have to submit, you have to submit to your husbands as he submits to Christ. Right? So in the case of, he is the authority in this house when he gives us an instruction, when he gives us um, whatever, we have to be real with ourselves and ask ourselves again, what holds me back from fulfilling that instruction? Do I not trust him enough? Do I not love him enough? Do I think I know better than what he does? Does he not understand what he's asking me to do, what he's asking me to give up? What it's asking me to you fill in the blank. Oh, all of the above. <laughs> the question then becomes, why is it about me instead of about him? And I think this is where a lot of a lot of the times people struggle. Is that we make the mitzvah about ourselves mm -hmm. or not about him. When he says, I want you to go and do this. If it's about him, yes, Lord. If it's about me, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? I've always been this way, now I'm acting weird. Mm. And then we think of how it's going to reflect on us instead of how it's going to reflect him. Okay? So something that they're probably missing here. He says, The angel of Adonai said to her, I will greatly increase your descendants. There will be so many that it will be impossible to count them. The angel of Adonai said to her, Look, you are pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You are to call him Ishmael. God pays attention. Now this is an Egyptian girl. Which God? Has any God appeared to any Egyptian and had a conversation like this? He goes, because Adonai has paid attention to your misery. He will be, now this is a prophecy for Ishmael. He will be a wild donkey of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. Living his life at odds with all his kinsmen. This is going to be a guy that loves to get into the thick of things. This is the father of the Arab nations today. They don't agree with each other and they definitely don't agree with anybody that has any sort of relation. Isaac included. So she named Adonai, who had spoken with her, El Roy. God of seeing or God who sees because she said I have really seen the one who sees me CJB has got you and stayed alive this is why the well will be called Be'er Lecha Roy the well of the one who lives and sees it lies between Kadesh and Beret now that testimony for this girl should have meant something amazing God exists. The God of Abraham is alive. The God who has now given me a promise for my seed. Later we see that how this seed becomes a problem. He will be at odds with everybody. He will be against his kinsmen. So all we've created from Sarai's point of view is a problem for Isaac and his descendants. And his descendants. You did not solve the problem or think you are able to do it, do God's work your way. If it's God's work, he has to do it. And that is a very tough thing for us to swallow sometimes. As Uncle Dell said, there's a point where if you've lost everything and you don't know what else to do, that you cannot fix it, God has to deal with it. 
He's the one in charge. He's the one that has to go forward. He's the one who has to bring forth the fruit. We have to be obedient, we have to live surrendered, and we have to be in submission to that reality. Even if it's uncomfortable. Hagar bore Avram a son, and Avram called the son whom Hagar had, Hagar had born Yishmael. Avram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Avram. He left at 75. We're talking about an 11 year thing coming together before he has a child that is actually of his seed, but not through Sarah. Next verse, when Avram was 99 years old. Okay. Still waiting. Still holding on. Adonai appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Now this is interesting. Why doesn't he appear to him and say, I am Elohim? Why does he say, why doesn't he say, I am Adonai Tzevaot? Or I am Ha'elyon? Why does he use the term El Shaddai? Many breasted ones. Well, that's the literal. <laughs> that's, just the, that's the literal translation, <laughs> right? Provider. Right. Yeah. No, it doesn't mean Almighty. Oh, she mm -hmm. It doesn't. Your translation will say it, but I'm telling you the root of it doesn't. Okay. The shad is a breast. A breast. Okay. Why would God use that as a picture of how he's trying to determine who you are to him and how he is to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Close, close. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that has to do... Uh, I think it was an expression of affection because Jesus also at the Last Supper, John was, they say, he was resting on his chest. rested on Jesus, so obviously I think it's, a, it's an expression of affection. Mm. And? It's, it's, it's nurturing. Yeah, it's nurturing, but it's re uh, reciprocal. I mean, if somebody puts their head on my breath, your automatic thing is to start reciprocating with the hand. Right. It's like, what do you need? Why are you here? You're here. Mm. You're here. Yes. You're here. The, the, it requires a reciprocity. And for a baby? Oh no, that's num num. <laughs> a total dependence. Uh -huh. That's in my nappy. That's what I am. And that's, I think I that's the no point in, and that's the point. All you need is. Yeah. I'm your every need. Okay, so look at the difference between God Almighty and what you just described. It's also a sign of a, f a favorite, a f favorite sign, because the Jesus is about John and Jesus. Is Jesus was the one he loved. Hmm. Uh, John Bye. was the one yeah. he loved. His head would lay on his breast. So. Hmm. Well, hmm. yeah, I think this has to point. But remember, he's sitting in the desert. I am the one that will provide. I am yeah. the one that's going to do this. I am the one that's going to bring it forth. Yeah. Not just about intimacy, but I am the one who's going to bring forth the milk. Yeah. I am the one that's going to make this happen. You don't need anything else. You just need me. Right? He's sitting here and he's showing him something that's at 99 years old. And he goes, this is me. Do you know there was a counterfeit of this? In Yeshua's time. Can you think of any idol that has a, a statue with many breasts? What was the goddess's name? You remember? Oh, is that thing where the little baby sit underneath and like... Not generally. It's literally a statue with a head and then there's just rows and rows and rows and rows and rows. Oh, I thought that was something else. Yeah. No, it was Roman. Actually, came from from Greece, but it was Artemis. 
Mm. Artemis. Great is Artemis of yeah. Thebes. Mm. Yeah. So when you look at st the, the, the story of Ephesus, it was the greatest um, place of Artemis worship yeah. left there. Yeah. Yeah. Now I want you to think about that from a Hebraic perspective or a God perspective. Mm. And you look at the counterfeit of what the enemy is going to do. Mm. Okay? So you think you need that? This is what you actually need. And then there's a counterfeit to that reality. Okay? Listen to what God says. Walk in my presence and be blameless. blameless. Tamim, which means blameless, complete, perfect, upright, or unblemished. Mm. All right, anybody want that commission? Be blameless, be complete, be perfect, be upright, or be unblemished. Now, God knows we cannot be perfect, since we're in the fallen nature. Okay? Being blameless depends on what we're using against us, but to be perfect or complete, to be upright, is to be someone that walks with Him, right? Be righteous. Okay? It says, walk in my presence. It says, I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will increase your numbers greatly. Avram fell on his face. He's appeared to him a number of times. Yeah. And his response is flat. 99 years old, guys. Mm -hmm. This. How much time do I have? How much time do I have? Can I still make an impact? Father, has he forgotten me? Whatever is going on, he's still making the point. I want to use you and this is what I'm going to do. He fell on his face and God continued speaking with him. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Avram, exalted father, but your name will be Avraham, father of many. Because I have made you the father of many nations. I will cause you to be very fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will descend from you. I am establishing my covenant between me and you. Along with your descendants after you, generation after generation, an everlasting covenant. Everlasting? Doesn't, doesn't say until Messiah comes, stop. Doesn't say if, if you receive the Holy Spirit, stop. This is forever. To be God for you or to you and for your descendants after you. Can you imagine that? I will be your God and you will be my people. This is your God. He is, remember what the term God means. L, L which means? Good. The first shepherd, or a strong shepherd, or the first teacher. He is our first. I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are now foreigners. All the land of, the, of Canaan as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. Promise. I mean, for that, for our kids alone, and your grandchildren, and your great grandchildren, that God would say, I will be their God. Isn't that one of the most mm -hmm. precious promises you could probably give? Mm -hmm. God said to Abraham, As for you, you are to keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, generation after generation, to keep, to hold on to it. It says, here is my covenant, which you are to keep between me and you, along with your descendants after you. Every male among you is to be circumcised. You are to be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. This will be a sign of a covenant between me and you. Generation after generation, every male among you who is eight days old, is to be circumcised. And it's funny that this image of the eight mm -hmm. comes back with blood. And why eight days specifically from a health perspective? 
Eight days when the blood is at the highest point of clotting. Right. The vitamin K, God goes, this is the best time to do it. Eight days, I'm doing something new. As in, it's new to you, but it's all part of the plan. Okay? So this becomes, who is the instruction for? The parent or for the child? The parent. So what is the parent saying to a child who's eight days old? You are in covenant with God. My God will be your God. It is not the baby's decision, is it? No. no. <coughs> it's you as a parent looking at that child going, this is the best thing I can give you. My God will be your God. How will he, how will he know? Well, God willing, I will show you what that relationship looks like so that you will want what I have. Baby doesn't have a choice. This is a promise that God, the parent is putting their trust and their hope in that promise. It is a way of saying, listen, Father, I'm going to hold you to this. Please be there where I can't. Please meet him when I can't. I mean, after having Jaden and building up to this whole thing, Tanya was... We were still, I would say, finding our feet. But um, looking at this, her firstborn child, finding a, a rabbi who was able to do this on eight days. Mm. You go through a lot of questioning of why you would look at this innocent little baby and think, I'm going to put you through something that you're probably not going to like. At eight days old. At eight days old. Mm. They just they just really know how to shout at you. <laughs> and you've got to think pretty hard mm. about what your motivation is for something like that because something so small, so precious, that's looking to you for everything. You look at that child and go, this is a good idea. <laughs> they don't think so. Mommy wasn't happy. Daddy was smiling from ear to ear. Baby was screaming his head off. Why was I smiling? Because the best thing, the best thing I could give my son was God. I am going to let him down. I am not going to be with him forever. But God never will. And if I could just take that step and put him on that place and say, this is why I'm here, Lord. All the discomfort, the cream, the ointment, the shouting, all of it. It meant nothing compared to the joy I felt when I knew I could hold on to this. my gift my gift to give him the best thing I have the only thing I can hold on to this is not just a simple operation of the flesh this is I will be your God I will be his you understand listen to what it says including slaves born within your household. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Gentile or not. Those bought from a foreigner not descended from you. If you are redeemed and you're being brought into this house, it's for you too. The slave born in your house and the person bought with your money must be circumcised. Thus my covenant will be in your flesh. It is not a piece of paper that you can lose. This is part of your identity. It's part of you. As an everlasting covenant, any uncircumcised male who will not let himself be circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person will be cut off from his people because he has broken my covenant. What is he saying in this context, guys, is that I don't want your God, 
I don't want your covenant. I refuse to receive the mark thereof. And God says, okay. You won't have me. You won't have my blessings. You won't have the gifts. This are for people who, again, want to be in. This is the thing with God. It's always an invitation. Notice an eight-day-year-old cannot go, sorry, I put my hand up, I refuse. These are for people that are being brought into the household. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are not to call her Sarai. They've got a side note here, which means mockery. Remember, it was generally princess or someone who quarreled. Her name is to be Sarah, princess. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give you a son by her. Truly, I will bless her. She will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. At this, Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. Not with ha 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 joy. He was genuinely blown away. As much as we look to Avram, you say, the father of our faith, remember Sarah was chosen to walk by his side. Nothing would have happened. No Messiah would have come if she was not there. He thought to himself, will a child be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah give birth at ninety? Avram said to God, if only had Ishmael could live, be, live before you or in your presence. God answered, no. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. And you are to call him Yitzhak, which means laughter. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. But as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Remember, Hagar's already been promised the blessing for Ishmael, yes? Mm -hmm. Listen to God reiterate it. I will bless him. I will make him fruitful and give him many descendants. He will father 12 princes, and I will make of him a great nation. I'll look after him, but I will establish my covenant with Yitzhak, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. Don't you love the way he's phrasing it? <coughs> I'm not going to give my covenant to Ishmael, I'm giving it to Yitzhak. Yitzhak is not even being conceived yet, and he's calling to him as if he is there. You see, the promise has already been established. The timing is what you're struggling with. The gift is there. With that, God finished speaking to Avram and went up from him. Avram took Ishmael, his son, all the slaves born in his house, and all who had been bought with his money. Every male among the people in Avram's household and circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin that very day. God gets up, a 99 year old man grabs a flint stone. <laughs> now that puts a very different picture in my head. If he's singing, Meet the Flintstone, no. it's a very different context. <laughs> And he sits there, and he lines up. How many men did he take to war? 318 of those who were trained. And he has a flint stone. No, we're not dealing with anesthesia. We're not dealing with numbing cream. We're not dealing with any of this stuff. I need you really to think. At 99 years old, what would be the key motivation factor for this man to do this? If you were Abraham, what, what is it that would make him get up and run? Get all the men. He's got to have a son. Possible. Promise for generation. Covenant with God. Fear of God. Does it sound like he was fearful? He hesitated more when he left Ur. Mm -hmm. He hesitated when he came up to Pharaoh. Say so you're my sister. He's up to his name. <laughs> Abraham, take your people and have them help and talk. <laughs> the first blessing situation. Have them help and talk. That's not help and talk. 
Let's go, boys. He gets to the place where he runs to do the mitzvah, where before he hesitated. He was partial. Look at the change in the man. That took time. Where you are, dealing with an instruction, gets you to the place. God is building up his faith, building up his obedience level to the point of, listen, I want you to take Isaac at 30 years old and we're going to walk up a mountain and let's deal with this. He's Yeah. But that puts also another Completely. It looked like a 12 year old boy. That's how we depict it. It's not. It's like, do we have to wait till we're almost 100 before we get it? All the stones are out your plot. This is like even David always see him as a little young boy. He was also in his 30s or something, I think. When? When he faced Goliath. No, no, I don't think he was. He was probably younger. Yeah. But. Let's bring it back. Yeah. Avram runs, lines up all the men of his house. That very day, just as God had said to him, Avram was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Yeah. Not an eight-day-year-old baby. Yeah. He grabbed hold of the <coughs> mitzvah and he says, I'm in. Yishmael, his son, was 13 years yeah. old. I'm when he was circumcised in his flesh. Avram and Yishmael, his son, were circumcised on the same day. There is no hesitation in this man. And all of the men in his household, both slaves born in his house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. And the next verse in chapter 18, Adonai appeared to Avram by the oaks of Mamre. He's taking these steps of obedience. He's taking this opportunity. And he's going, here I am, Lord. Remember at the beginning when we said, what was that question mark? He says, what's good of, what, what is the point of all of this? And now all of a sudden he gets an instruction and he's, and he's done. And he's running. Sometimes our hesitation about doing stuff, I don't know about you guys. But when God gave me an instruction like wearing city or getting tefillin or in, in many of the cases the, you have a sense of hesitation mm-hmm. because I don't know, for me it was about I made it about what people would think of me, number one and I also made it about Probably not understanding the point of it. I understood yeah, yeah. the basic point of it, but I didn't understand the bigger picture. Yeah. And I was like, why is that piece important? Mm. And as you surrender and you go, okay, Father, you know what? I don't, mm. I'm going to do this anyway. I got over myself and then Abba was able to use that for something different. Mm. You know, with the sit-sit, it became a marker that brought a third of the congregation that we have in Benoni. Without the tzitzit, we probably wouldn't have got there so quickly. But it was for me. I had to process that. I had to go, okay, Father, you know what? You asked me to do this. I'm trusting you with this. I really don't feel like it. I don't want to. It's going to make me feel odd, but I'm going to take that step of faith. Mm. And how many times has it been? I don't know. You guys have, will have your own testimonies. But when we obey, is it normally good things or bad things that come from that obedience? Good things. We have more peace. We have more passion. We have this delight. And it's not in ourselves. It's delight in God. And we find that joy. Abraham at 99 years old. Ran. To fulfill this mitzvah and waited he had to wait a full year to see the beginning of this promise can you imagine holding Isaac in that moment 
you've got to stop and you've got to ask him at that point you know father how big is this is anything impossible for you looking at that child in your hands and going this took steps of obedience to get to this point and through this will come messiah your obedience your step your surrender your walk with god one step at a time we have no comprehension of what god is going to use that moment to reach how many more if we can just look past ourselves for a minute If he gave up his life and he's asking you to give up clothing or food or a day who are we to hang back everything he gives us is for his glory to be part of that and that's something special. Any questions, any thoughts? Father, we thank you again for this time as family. I want to thank you for the people that are sitting at the table. Father, we just think of Andre as well, Father. And Father, we just we thank you for dealing with us where we are. Thank you for giving us time. Thank you for opening up our hearts and our minds. Father, thank you for bringing peace. Mm -hmm. Father, we just pray for direction. Help us to walk upright before you so that we may, we may reflect you. Father, we just also just pray for Auntie Bev. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray that you would just bring healing and strength to her bones. Father, we just pray that you would give her the answers she needs, Father, so that she can get better father and we also just pray for whatever is holding her back father i just pray that you nullify it father we just pray for um friends dad as well father that you would bring complete healing and and auntie and just step on father we just thank you that you are in each and every situation we thank you father that you continue to hear our prayers as we just lift them up and father we just thank you for what you're doing in us and the new people that are that that are coming father we thank you for your kingdom, your ministry, Father. And I thank you for these workers, this family that that you've called together. We just give you glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.